Welcome to week eight. Now that I've gotten those kinds of announcements out of the way, as you can see, I've written some dates on the board. Assignment one, tonight's the drop dead time, except if you're one specific person who has made arrangements ahead of time due to circumstances. Uh, if it's not in by midnight, TFB, automatic zero. Uh, you won't even be able to submit it. It's going to just disappear. So, you know, there's a handful of you who haven't submitted anything yet. Get her done. Or at least get it submitted. Lab 7 this week. Obviously, it's what you should be working on this week. Instructions have been updated because I noticed I did a stupid. And my instructions were wrong. The very first instruction on how to restore the database um, was definitely as wrong as wrong could be. So I have now amended those instructions. Do as usual by next week. Hybrids 5 to 7. I figured I'd give you guys a bit more heads up than last time. Do July 9th. You guys know what that means. That week there'll be a test. Just putting it out there. Okay. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to cover a variety of functionality to help improve the quality of your queries. Yeah. I will be reopening them. Um, actually, I meant to reopen the first batch already. Uh, but there's there's two people that haven't done them yet due to circumstances. Thus, I was giving them a chance without, you know, going through other people's whatever. Same large as the first one. Same deal. Very, very similar. All right. So, today I am going to... The first five things we're covering are going to go fairly well. The last one's going to hurt. Probably hurt a lot. Um, the first one will go fast. The second one will go fast. The next two are fairly contained to each other. They actually go hand in hand. And the last, the second last one is uh, fairly straightforward also. And like last week, I'll go through the slides. There are 11 of them, including the title slide, so this will go fast. And then I'll do a demo of each of the, the concepts. Um, sometimes you have data that seems to be duplicated. Whether or not you've got duplicated email addresses or parts of the data is duplicated, sometimes you don't want the duplicate entries coming back out. So there's a keyword called distinct. So normally I've shown you guys how to do select star or select you know, name and email. But if you put in the, mat, the keyword distinct after the word select, it will only return rows where the content is unique across the entirety of what you're selecting. So if you select one field, it'll give you the distinct value from one field. If you use distinct on three fields, it's the combination of the three fields that have to be unique. If you do a, sele a distinct select star, you might as well not use the word distinct because there's so much uniqueness at that point that you're never going to get anything useful out of it. Especially if you're including the primary key, because every primary key is unique. And since distinct gives you the unique combinations of each of the columns, it's always going to be unique. Therefore, distinct is useless if you use it with star. Ordering is the next order of business. Um, ordering is to let you sort your results. So far, when you've been working, you just did select star from whatever, and the data comes out in whatever order it happens to be in the database. Now, Postgres is a bit of a funny beast in how it handles its data. And some of you may have noticed this when you were doing uh, the work where you had to do updates. When you change the data, whatever row you did isn't, doesn't stay where it used to be, it goes to the end. So suddenly you could have one, two, three, five, and then four. Because four is the last record you touched. It always goes to the end. Uh, it's just how Postgres writes its data in the database. Other servers do it differently. But there's a reason why Postgres is used for high volumes as opposed to MySQL. And that's one of the reasons it's data differently and efficiently. Um, so 
As a result, sometimes you need to sort your data because the data randomly changes order in the database. Therefore, there's a clause called order by. Order by comes right at the end. So if we did select star from table, whatever clause it is, right at the end, you'd have order by. You'd name the column you want to sort it, and it'll sort by that column. By default, it sorts ascending. For those of you that don't know what that means, it means 0 to 9, A to Z, capital A to capital Z. Uh, other character sets, I can't tell you what it's going to do. But I'm assuming it would sort in the same order as your alphabet. And as for the Asian languages, I have no idea what how it sorts. No clue. Um, total mystery to me. But by default, it sorts ascending. You can force it to sort ascending by putting a modifier. When I do the demo later, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, and you can also sort by multiple fields, but you have to put a comma between them. So if you want to sort by city and then by name, you can do that. If you want to sort by province and then by city, you can do that too. It'll sort by the first one and then sort by the second one. It'll subsort. Anybody here ever have to deal with large volumes of paper that needs to be sorted by hand? And they tell you I want it sorted a certain way. So you end up sorting everything into each of the provinces and then you take each of those piles and you sort them each to each whatever. Or those have really large extent families and you decide you're only going to mail one envelope full of Christmas cards to each set of people so you can save on postage. You know, you end up sorting through the pile, see who lives in Sheet Harbor, which one lives in Newfoundland, which one lives up the valley, because you don't want to pay more than you have to for your Christmas cards. Or do like we do and just stop giving them out because they're too damn expensive. But you can sort by multiple fields. You can sort by any field in your select list. You can even sort by fields that aren't in the select list. You can do what they call an invisible sort, which means you're going to sort the data by something that's not being returned as part of the query. So if you go select name, comma, email, but then you can order by their their province, and you can therefore have your list sorted by province, even though it's not included in for the ride. Why would you want to do that? I have no idea, but you can. Now, how many of you have used a spreadsheet? Yay. Actually, that's pretty good. Usually I say, how many of you have used Excel? And then I've got like five. Then I go, how many of you, okay, how many of you have used uh, Open Office? Like two. Then I go, what the hell are you guys the rest of you using? I'm on a Mac. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is on Mac numbers, I think it's called. Whatever. Um, but yes, you've used spreadsheets. And then those of us that are old enough will have something called Lotus123. That'll ring a bell. Yay. Uh, for those of you that don't know what Lotus123, that's what invented the spreadsheet market. Eh? Why? Because it's a spreadsheet. It's not a database. There's a limit of how much it can hold per sheet. It's actually surprisingly powerful, but there is a very big limit of what it can handle. And then you hit a wall, and then everything goes wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. Um, but Excel is actually surprisingly capable, especially the latest builds, which are 64-bit. A lot of the limits we had went away which is actually a terrible thing in its own way because people are trying to use it as a database. It's not a database. It's a spreadsheet. Which those of you, how many of you have taken accounting in school? Hot damn. How many of you had to do it with the paper where they made you do it all by hand? It's fun, eh? Those good old big sheets of uh, general ledger doing double entry by hand. That is a spreadsheet, essentially. And that's a paper spreadsheet. There's a limit how much you can put on a piece of paper. Excel's the same way. Once you go past a certain number of columns, you're really defeating the point of a spreadsheet. But, you know, you can get up to, like, now three alphanumeric numbered columns, like FFF. So, you know, personally, I think if you've you got a spreadsheet going up to FFF, you're probably effed. So, you know, I'm recording, so I couldn't use the actual word. All right, the reason I ask this is one of the big functionalities in Excel or any other spreadsheet is the ability to aggregate your data. 
By aggregate, I mean people know how to use sum or average or, you know, min, max, or VLOOKUP in this case. But you can put in parameters, feed it a function, and it does math for you. That's the magic of the spreadsheet. Um, databases had it before spreadsheets did. Originally, our, our selection of math functions, the aggregate functions, was pretty small. Um, and believe it or not, that sets pretty much all people use still today, for the most part. Um, basically, you can use it to aggregate various things. And the next slide I'll have um, some examples. There is another clause you must throw in in every database except for MySQL, which is why my, I can never take MySQL seriously. As you can see at the bottom, it says you must group by, which I'll be explaining what the group by clause is. But if you're going to do an aggregate and you have a display field, you have to group by the display field. Otherwise, the data is meaningless. When I do the demo, you'll see what I mean. These are, you know, highlight points for the demo. Um, MySQL allows you to do a, 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 an aggregate without a group. And what does it do? Is it grabs the very first text value of the non-aggregate column and say, here's your total. Totally meaningless. Totally useless data. Um, okay, so here are the common aggregates that you, most people use. Count, which obviously is obvious. It counts the number of distinct rows. If you have a distinct keyword, otherwise it just counts the number of rows in the result set. So if you say select star from customers, or if you do select count star from customers, and there's 10,000 customers, it'll give you an answer of 10,000. It count counts the number. Min max, it finds the biggest or the smallest value in that given column. Real handy. If you want to know what the biggest price was, or what the largest whatever it is, or the smallest whatever it is. Uh, average, that one's pretty obvious. What's the average value of the fields? Some people say, well, what's the point of doing averages? Well, let's just say you run a business where the sales reps are allowed to adjust the price at will. And you need to know what the average sell price is. Therefore, how do you figure out an average normally? You sum up the total divided by the count. It does it for you much faster. Sum. The reason this is where I asked about Excel. If you've used a spreadsheet, you've probably used the sum button. Now, if you're using a spreadsheet and you've actually never done a sum, you're using it wrong. Hot damn, good job! <laughs> that was good. By the way, for people that aren't here right now, somebody just passed a quiz. Because <laughs> that didn't get picked up, but now it did. You want to talk about me distracting Dan? That's it right there. <laughs> Whew. Then it was summing. It adds up the values of whatever column. You cannot sum up strings. You can't add up A plus B plus 9 plus Z. You sum up numbers. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5. It just takes every column and adds up all the values and gives you a grand total. As a footnote, Postgres has 14 additional aggregate functions that are used for stats. It's insane the amount of functions uh, Postgres gives you for that. The financial guys would appreciate standard deviation, especially if you're doing investments. Or the statistical analysis of a, of a set through time, it's, it's got a function for that, um, which is kind of cool. If you really want to know what it has, go look up Postgres documentation. Just Google for PostgreSQL aggregate functions. And you'll get a big list of about 18. And they throw in a couple of extras every version they release, major versions. So when I did these slides, it was at 14 extra. I think it might be 16 now. Um, it's pretty crazy, actually, this full set of features it's got. OK. Now. I've only got a couple more points to take, and actually I'm going to break up the slides and the demo separately uh, because I want to do the demo for this stuff first, and then I'll do the demo for the joins after because that's going to hurt. So let's just say 
you want to know if you're doing an aggregate and you're counting rows and you only want to know the ones that have three or more rows in the set there's a clause called having it's just like where but it's only used on the aggregates and here's the catch when I do the demo I'll demonstrate this you cannot filter on an aggregate in the where clause why can you not filter on an aggregate in the WHERE clause? Because it hasn't been calculated yet. The WHERE clause happens right at the beginning. It goes, give me all the data that matches this pattern, and then it applies the aggregates to what it's filtered. Therefore, the HAVING clause was something they threw in about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, so that you can then filter down the result set oh, based on you know, the count of things. And, well, I got an example here. Having the count of everything greater than two sounds weird. Once I show you, it'll make a lot more sense. And I'll be posting a complete example because I'll throw on every single concept for the, all the first seven slides in one query at the end of the demo. Okay, the last one is aliases. Um, anybody remember that really terrible show? Yeah, those of us that are past a certain age remember how bad that show was with Jennifer Gardner and her stick-out ears before she got her ears pinned back. <laughs> People are laughing, it's true. Her ears are like this during that show. But the point of an alias is, is the ability to rename something temporarily. And that's something that you can't do in a normal programming language. Like you create a variable and you give it a name you can't change the name of that variable once it's running. You can't. You can't. Well, you can in PHP, but you can't in Java. <laughs> um, however, in SQL, you can rename objects. And there's a reason for the ability to do it. Sometimes you need to use the object more than once in a query. And you can't query the same thing twice. So you give it an alternate name. Um, you can rename fields also known as columns, or you can rename tables. Um, field renaming is good for ensuring valid names when the data is being received by a program. And when I do the aggregates, I'll, you'll see what the issue is. Um, and table renaming becomes important when joins are involved, which is what I'll be doing in the second half of this lecture. And this is what an alias looks like. And there's a weird in the syntax, because when you name, rename a column, you have to use the as keyword. But when you rename a table, there's no as. Why? Because the guys were in different rooms when they implemented it. That's the only explanation for why it is the way it is. But this last line shows an alias. So in the end, the count will be come out as customer count, and customers is now known as C. This is OK for the way it is, but often when you have really big table names that are like multiple words, sometimes you'll want to short it down a little bit. Like, you know, order entry, logs. You want to shorten that because you have kept typing every time you use it, it's kind of gross. Okay, now I'm going to go to demo mode for a little bit so I can cover what I just did. Yeah. When you need to rename, well, when I do the demo, I'll show you. It's better if I actually physically show you what it's going to do as opposed to um not i guess now i'm going to be using the thinkcube database again as soon as i get my my display here so i can see what's happening over here all right now start with this this is uh the 10 second review from last week and that should be fairly uh, obvious to what you're used to seeing. However, let's just say I want to know a few different things. Let's say I want to sort by name. So earlier, I think one of the first things I talked about was ordering. If I go, now let's say I want to just grab uh, the name the and the city 
So right now it seems to be coming out in a random order. Nothing too fancy. But if I go order by name, <coughs> and it's going to sort out uh, alphabetically, ascending. There's uh, everything sorted by the person's name. And now you can see down here in the city where the city's not ordered yet. And I can go order by city also. And now I've got sorted by name and city. Uh, one of the obvious spots is these two columns. Oops. Really? This one and this one. They have the same name, but they're in two different cities, and now it's sorted alphabetically. B comes before O. And if I wanted to sort it descending just for the city, the keywords, well, shortened version descending, and now you'll see that the same two rows, now O and then B. That's all there is to sorting is that. Not too complicated. It's a fairly straightforward concept. This is a great um, table for me to do a few examples. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can go ascending here, or I could go descending if I wanted to, and then city ascending. You can mix match that to your heart's content. What it does is it sorts by the first one first, and then it subsorts by the second one. And if you have a third one, then it'll subsort a third time. Um, there's no conflict. Basically, it does the first one, and then it does the second one, then it does the third one. So it's a bit like when you have a big pile of paper you got to deal with. Or if you're like I am, where I'm really lazy and I don't put my bills away every month, I just stack them up in a pile, and then, you know, it's time to do my filing. At the, once in a while, I'll sort out bills in piles and then, you know, deal with them that way. Sort first by bill and then sort by date, then put them in the filing cabinet. Um, that's basically you have you don't, you don't have a limit. Yeah, yeah. There's no limit, but there is a cost. Every time you add a sort, obviously it's got to sort. Therefore, it's adding a little overhead to the processing. Um, it's something I haven't shown you guys yet. It's this little thing here. This is called the execution plan, and it shows the query. And you can see first it does the it grabs the data from the customer, then it sorts it. When I do more complicated queries, you'll see that this gets much more complicated. But you can see right here that the sort cost, that's the price tag right there, which was 951 milliseconds, or microseconds. The actual data pull, which you can't see, was a cost of 0 to 280. The sort was 951 to 977. So the sort is, you know, a thousand times more expensive. But did it really make a difference? No. It's still, well, 278 milliseconds for that sort. If I take off the city and just sort by name, 281. As you can see, it doesn't make a difference on that level. If I take the sort right off, it's shaved off 30 milliseconds. So the sort's adding 30 milliseconds. 10,000 rows. So if you're dealing with a million rows, that sort's going to start eating up more and more and more. It's like anything else. The more data you work with, the more expensive the sort gets. Okay. So, so far, I've got name and city. Now let's just say I want to know how many people have the same name but in different cities. Um, or how many people have the same name in the same city? That's actually a better query. I want to count the names. But if I do that, now this might look funny, but I'm going to count the names. I also want to pull the city. You cannot do an aggregate unless you group by the, with that, what's called the display fields. In other words, any field not involved in an aggregate must be sorted by, I mean must be grouped by. The sorting is irrelevant. So if I run this, and I got an error message, because name is no longer included in there, so I'm going to take my order by off for the time being. 
just to make things run. Now, you can see how many people live in each city. It's not grouping by people's names, it's grouping by city. Apparently I got 477 people that live in Dublin. Ireland's a happy place. Uh, 10 people live in Pocatello. You know, 13, so same all the fussy. I almost said another word that started with F by accident. 13 live in Richmond. So, so far this is useful data, but it's not as useful as it could be. Now, remember earlier you asked about aliases. Why do you want to use an alias? If you look right where my mouse is, do you see what this is? This column is called? It's called count. It's coming back as the name of the aggregate. Now what happens if you're counting two different things? You end up with two columns, both called count. It's not that useful. Are they no, they're going to be no, they're going to be called count, both called count. Um, and unless you've coded your application very in a very special way, you're going to have issues. And you guys haven't learned about arrays yet, have you? This week, ah, okay, shut up. Okay. But for those of you that have experienced arrays and you used what they call a key value pair array, in other words, a named column array, name indexed array, okay, whatever, Perl sucks. Um, I know it's a lot of programming languages allow you when you retrieve data out of the database that each of the array elements, instead of being element zero, element one, element two can have a name. And if you have two elements with the name count, you're only allowed to have one in the, in the array with the same name per item. Therefore, it's going to keep one of the two values and discard the other, which is very bad. So instead of that, you want to make it sort of useful. So I'm going to give it a name, and here's my alias. See, now I have something called a name count, and it's a proper column name which means if I'm using a programming language, it's going to get returned properly as something can be addressed properly. You don't want duplicate column names coming back. It's just not a good plan. <coughs> All right, so now I'm going to do, and I lost my mouse, there we go. I'm going to bring back my order by clause. And is it going to let me do this? I believe so. Ta-da. Because I renamed up up here, I can now use it elsewhere with the same name. Sort of descending. Therefore, we can see which city has the most people in it. Spakens the Duch, also known as Berlin, has the most. Dublin is next. Galway is after that, and Belfast has after that. Hamburg, Cork, Bremen, and Bremerhaven, Haven, whatever the heck that is is there. So you can see that it's sorting out a set number. So, so far I've demonstrated the count aggregate. I've shown you an alias. I've shown you the group by clause. I've shown you ordering. There's, I'll do a, one more demonstration that has one, so that you have a, literally one query that has one of everything in it that I've taught so far. And then I'll show you some of the other aggregates. It's the having clause. I'll make that one uppercase so it stands out because I'm talking. Having is special because what happens, here's how the, the magic works. It does the from. And if I had a where clause, I'll just put in a, a really useless where clause for the moment because one's always equal to one, so it's always true. Then what it does is it, gra it does this these two things, then it does the aggregate, which is then grouped, then you can filter it down. I'll take that where clause off for the moment. So uh, let's say I want to go, actually I think I got to, I'm going to try this, I can't remember if this is going to work. Let's say I want to know every city that has more than 100 people registered in it. 
And I'm going to go run. And I, hopefully it doesn't blow up in my face. Yeah, that's what I thought was going to happen. There we go. That's something you can do in MySQL. I just couldn't remember which side it was that allowed it and didn't allow it. So, so far, you've noticed that although I've aliased my aggregate, the having clause doesn't let you use the alias. You actually have to use the function. And what's really cool is you can actually have uh, down here as part of this, you can actually aggregate on a column that doesn't exist in your query. So you can actually filter further past what you've got. Um, but basically put here, you've got a query that uh, gives me every, every city that has more than 100 people in it. And I'm going to change this to greater than 2 because this is going to get funky. So literally this is a query that has one of everything I've taught last week and this week so far in it. I will be posting this example on Blackboard. And I'll, I'll annotate it for your enjoyment to explain what's happening. So, but to make it short, and I'll stand and go point this stuff out. All right. Here's the pieces that I've taught. I taught you guys about select. Here's our first aggregate where I'm counting the different names. Then giving an alias as, as name count so that it returns a nice column name. I'm also retrieving city. I'm pulling it from customers. Where person's name starts with A, so I want to know, give me all the cities, give me uh, the count of people per city whose names start with A. That's what I've asked for so far. I'm going to group it by city because if you have an aggregate and you have a display field also, in other words, a field that's not part of the aggregate function itself, you have to include it in the group by, otherwise you'll get an error message. I say I want where the count's more than two, in other words, where the count of names per city that start with A is more than two. And then I'm just sorting it at the end. That's a fairly useful, by useful I'm putting like big air quotes on that. Yeah. Yes, sir. That is literally the order of it. Um, and then there's actually almost every major clause of the SQL language except for one in here. So the order of it is literally as displayed on the screen. It's always select from where group by having order. There is no acronym for it. There's no uh, there's no mnemonic to help you remember the order other than that's the order. Um, but actual fact, I can probably post that on Blackboard also what the order is. Um, <coughs> The count of name, that's an aggregate function. So this is an aggregate. This is the aggregate being aliased. This is a column that is not part of the aggregate, also known as a display field or summary field. That's the from clause. That's our where clause. And basically the where clause is um, well, you know, the filter. The grouping has to exist uh, because we have a summarizing field. Therefore, you have, to sum, you have to tell it how to summarize. The having clause allows us, and that one's not required. Having is not required. Having is there if you want to thin out the herd a little bit. In other words, if you want to basically have a where clause on the results of your math, That is the syntax. Just like you can't use an if as a as a as a for loop, you can't use a, a having as a where. Having is designed specifically for, to working with aggregate functions. Where is to pre-filter before you aggregate. Thus, they have two different words because they serve two different jobs. And the last clause is order by, which is sorting your results. That one's fairly straightforward. It's just syntax. 
I am going to copy this. I'm going to launch this and save that there so I can post it on Blackboard for you guys as soon as I'm done this lecture, I hope. Okay, now I'm going to show you guys a few of the other aggregate. Yep. Uh, no, only if you want to reduce the result set. Um, I'll show you guys a few other uses for it. It works same syntax as where, except it's made specifically for aggregates. Well, not necessarily, but if you need to filter it down a little bit, then you have, if you need to reduce, let's say you're dealing with a million rows, the aggregates can be really expensive. And maybe you just want to know the things that were sold in the last 10 days. To do that, you do a where clause to retrieve the last 10 days worth of rows, and then you aggregate on it. They have different jobs. Uh, the where clause is to reduce the data set you're working with. Having is to help you thin out the summarization. Okay, so oh, forgot that was big. Okay, so here's a different table, and actually, I'm going to go with order lines. Why? Because that one has numbers to work with. All right, 114,000 rows, a little more data. Now, as you can see, we have extended prices, we have quantities, we have prices. This should almost look familiar. If it doesn't, you haven't been doing your labs. At least this structure should look familiar. Not this table itself specifically, but this structure should look familiar. All right, so this gives me all kinds of room for doing aggregates. Let's just say I want to know what the average quantity is per product. So each order comes in and each order line has a quantity on it. We want to know per product ID. For now, I'm just going to work the IDs. What the average quantity is. So how many on average did they add of each product to a given order? So if I were to do something like this, Really? Like this. When I'm lazy and I don't feel like typing, run. Alrighty then. Now, we have our product version ID and we have our average quantity. Not that useful, but not that unuseful either. What this is telling me is on average for product 129, whatever that might be, which after I go to the next section of the lecture, this will get a lot more legible. We put 2.954 blah 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 to add infinitum in here. It's numeric. Now what's really cool is we can have multiple aggregates per. Actually, I'm going to count the product version ID. Quantity doesn't make a difference. It amounts to the same thing. Like that. Boom. And as you can see, we can have multiple aggregates. You can run as many aggregates as you want at the same time. After a while, it gets kind of anal and kind of pointless because you're just going to keep accumulating
and I'm going to run that. Now, as you can see, yeah, the max quantity is 5, the min quantity is 1, and it just so happens is how it goes because that's pretty much how my data got generated, where the max could be 5 and the min was 1. Yay! Um, now, I'm going to add an order by on this. Like that. Like such. Now, I'm sorting by the product version. It's still not that useful, but it's still more useful. What is more useful, though, might be which product gets sold on average the most. And how, suddenly here we see that there's three that get sold the most on average. That one has 1,131. This one has 1,171, but it's sold on average less because on per given order, it's not ordered as much. They just ordered more of them more often. There's just numbers. People that took stats would care about these kinds of numbers. Management cares about these kinds of numbers. And often what you'll want in here also is maybe So you want to know the ones that are greater than three. Woo. So now we're down to only 38 rows being returned. And as you can see, the more I aggregate, the faster this is getting because I'm filtering, filtering, filtering. Um, so this, ex this particular demo shows you that you can use more than one aggregate. Um, you can run them at the same time. However, there's one thing you're not allowed to do. And a lot of people try this, and it always blows up. Yeah, before I continue. Why are you changing the average quantity to, like, or the count product version as PV underscore count? Like, why are you breaking it? Why am I renaming them as I go? Yeah. Because. If I run it like this. Uh, I need to go grab this. It'll show right here average, count, min, max. And what happens if you need to do multiple maxes or max, multiple mins? Let's say I want to work with the prices instead of the quantities. And I want it with the max prices and the max quantity, which I could go like this. Like that. Right now I've got max, min, max, min. Can you tell me which one's which? No. Did that answer your question? I like demonstrate. I like people answering their own questions, right? It, it helps. But as you can see, you can even do aggregates on different columns at the same time. As long as you don't start getting too fancy about your groupings, the data is always valid. And on a financial level, these two are pretty useless. These two are useful, and these two are very useful. Okay, now, what the heck was I about to do? Oh, thank you. A lot of people, I'll ask sometimes a question, and I'm pretty sure it's not in this lab. I hope it's not, because I haven't taught you guys how to resolve this issue that I'm about to demonstrate. You cannot aggregate an aggregate. And you guys are going, what do you mean by that? Oh, that column's called quantity. Okay, for example, I'm going to sum up the quantity. And I'm going to get rid of this having clause so things are a little more sane. So you can see here, here's my sum. But let's just say I want to know what the average sum is. You're aggregating an aggregate. You're not allowed to do that. If you ever try to do that, you'll get this message. Aggregate function calls cannot be nested. Or at least that's how my, uh, my uh, Postgres tells you. MySQL just blows up and gives you some weird error code and dies. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server gives you pretty much a useful message, and I, I'm assuming Oracle does also. I've never tried this on Oracle, so. But I'm assuming you can. There's a way of resolving that. I'm actually teaching that one next week. Um, because, yeah. 
How can you do it? That's why I said I'll teach it next week. There's a reason to come back next week. <laughs> no, that's just I need to teach a couple of other principles first before I get to that because it's a little more complicated. Um, but you cannot aggregate an aggregate as it stands. There are ways of doing it. It's not straightforward and it's not obvious, but it is doable. Um, honestly, they provide enough functions to avoid this most of the time anyways. So you cannot aggregate an aggregate and that's just life. Um, I'm going to put in the big one here that had the nice names on it. Uh, greater than two, greater than three. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it in my little document I've got on the go here. And yes, I am keeping track of it just so you guys, just so you see it. And I have lost my query window. There we go. Okay. So that's the aggregates. That's the having clause. That's the order by. That's the alias. Yes. Oop, not mimic. That's a clause I usually teach later. But there it is. Limit 10. Um, as you can see, that one comes right at the end. The very last one. Uh, limit. Let's do, say, give me 10. And only 10. So this will give me the top 10. And if somebody really wants to know what the number 1 is, that's the number 1. I taught limit, I can take it off my next slideshow. Um, limit is straightforward. Um, actually, I can go... There's also one called offset, which adds that, which gives me like number three. Right, so you can offset by, take the first one, move down two, and then give me the number kind of thing. This one is almost never used, except when you have uh, web apps that you know you have paging, next page, next page, next page. That's exactly what it's doing. It's running the same query a second time, but then it's going offset 10 or offset 30. And then you're on the next page, it's offset 60, offset 90, 120, 150. By whatever your page length is, it runs an offset for that. It's That's the only time this is really useful, unless you want to know what the not top 10 are. So what are the top 10 and what are the not top 10? The next after the top 10. The oh so close but not quite guys. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the clauses that you can do as off a single table, if that makes sense to you. Um, if at this point we need to pull more data than this from more than one source, it leads me into uh, my next topic, which is going back to the slideshow now, yay. Um, which is this. And which is joins. I usually try to avoid breaking up my lectures into two chunks. But this is the, one of the few topics where I have to break it down. Okay. Don't forget everything I just taught. But if you have a very short memory span, this is probably everything you just learned till. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, queries are useful. As I showed you, you can summarize data on a single table so far. And you can actually get some somewhat meaningful data out of it. You can get min, max, averages. Uh, you can find everybody who's in a given state or in a given province or a given country. That's straightforward. In the last query I ran, I said, you yeah, know, it's product 198. What the hell is product 198? Unless you're magical and you have every SKU memorized, you know, like the cashiers at Loblaws, both male and female, 
Four zero one one. Who can tell me what that is? <laughs> That's the only one I can remember. I never have to punch that one. Actually, if I remember right, uh, four one two five is uh, Macintosh apples. But I've bought them so much, I know the codes off the top of my head. But you know, four zero one one is bananas. That's a magic number, right? <laughs> People are laughing because I used that number. But yeah, it, it works, right? Um, I distracted myself. <laughs> but anyways, these are magic numbers. When you're dealing with a corporation, like for example, the company I work for, we currently have 1,200 different products defined in our database. We, over the last 25 years, we've sold 1,200 different products or flavors of products. It doesn't mean it's 1,200 distinct products. It could be the same product with three different flavors. Some of these are products that we don't sell, that our resellers sell, or, or OEMs resell, like Canon, Epson, HP. They, re some of, they actually resell some of our software for us, and it's been rebadged. It looks like it's their product. Uh, why? Because ours is better than theirs. That's how if we specialize, you know. Um, you know, so we rebadge. But we have all these magic numbers in the system, you know. What's package 336? That's a useless number. Nobody knows what 336 is, uh, except for me, because I look at the data all the time, and I'm stuck looking at these stupid numbers. Um, what you want to do is you want to display meaningful data to your end users. To be meaningful, that means you need the descriptions. And to do that kind of stuff, you end up using something called joins. This is where you pull data from more than one table at the same time. In other words, we want to grab the description of the product from the products table and the numbers out of the order lines, and we want to display them together. That means we're grabbing two different bins and collating the results and matching them up. And out of all of SQL, joins is the hardest thing people have a hard time with. The examples I had up on the screen up till now, you guys can grab that example and go, I understand what this is. If not, I can still work with this till I figure it out. With joins, you basically have to understand how it works. Otherwise, it's never going to work. So now, I say there's three common types, but I have four listed. Um, there's, that's, there's a reason I use that. There's the inner join, which is the join that is used 95% of the time. That is the number one join. It can be abbreviated to just the word join. Normally you'd have inner join. It can be abbreviated to just join. There's left join and right join. I'm covering those next week. The, they're basically, they're mirrors of each other. There's the full join, which is, um, anybody here ever work with a data matrix? No? Good. Uh, some of you may have learned this in high school where you take all the values of one table set and then you match them up to all the values of another table set. So you end up with, if you have three values in one table and three values in the other, you end up with nine possible combinations, or 27, sorry, three to the three. So you got 27 possible combinations. That's what a full join does. Um, I have an example for that and I'll show it next week. It's a deck of cards. But I am going to focus on the inner join for today. And I've had arguments with people about whether or not we should use Venn diagrams to explain joins. And the general consensus is you should never use a Venn diagram to explain a join because once you go past the inner join, they're useless, the Venn diagrams. But at least for the inner join, the Venn diagram works. Okay. So basically put, an inner join is a join between two tables where whatever clause you provide matches in both. In other words, it gives me the data from table A and the data from table B where the match is perfect and exists in both. Thus, you know, you got stuff from A and you've got stuff from B and then you've got the stuff that matched between the two. In other words, for example, you have products with their IDs and you have a product ID in your database, in your order lines. The product ID in your order line matches the ID of a product in the other table. That's the little red area. 
There's two syntaxes for the inner join. There's the old syntax. So if you go online, you search how to do an SQL join, you will learn one of, it'll show you one of two possible syntaxes. There's the old syntax, which is very gross. Uh, from A comma B, where A dot ID is equal to B dot A underscore ID. Anyways, it's terrible. Um, that's how Oracle created it. Because they were the first ones to have joins, and they were the first ones to add it in. It was pretty horrifying uh, when you wanted to do other kinds of joins, because you had this really weird syntax you had to use. It looked like Perl. Um, you had asterisks in weird places and minus signs and plus signs in weird places that just didn't make sense, but that's how you had to do it. Um, in the 80s, early 90s, the standard, the ANSI standard for SQL said, this is dumb. Use this syntax instead, which is using the join clause, which is what I'm going to be teaching you guys. I don't teach the first method because it's useless past inner joins. However, the full the syntax for join the with the ISO standard or the ANSI standard uh, join syntax is as the second one there from A join B on and you tell it what the points of commonality is. And then the keyword inner is optional. If you use just the word join, it assumes inner automatically. All right. A few extra notes about joins before I do another demo. Number one, you do not have to join from the primary to the foreign key. You can join any column to any other column. It's kind of useless, but you can do it. You can join anything to anything else, but whether or not the data works, who knows. Uh, you can join as many tables as you want. Obviously, every the more you add in, the more expensive it gets because it's got to collect data from more than one place. Um, the order of the joins is important. You can't join a table that's not. You can't if you're let's say you're joining orders, order lines, and products. You can't go order lines join to products unless products is in the list ahead of it. So the order of the join is important. You can join only to tables that are already in the list ahead of time. You can't join the tables that are below it in the list. Sounds weird, but once I just demo it, you'll see. Uh, aliases are an easy way to shorten table names for joins, because after a while, the table names get kind of ridiculous. Um, also, if tables have duplicate field names, you have to start doing a table prefix. It's a syntax you haven't seen yet. I've got an example on here. Uh, usually, you'll have problems when you're dealing with primary keys especially if you're using this naming conventions I've forced you guys to use. If every table has an ID column, and then you tell it to sort or to uh, have a where clause on the ID, and you have ID in more than one place, it's going to say, dude, which one do you want to deal with? That's just how it is. Because it's called, it's an ambiguous clause at that point, because it doesn't know. So back to the demos. All right. All right. So this database that we've been working with has, I'm clicking, clicking, but I'm clicking on something else here. There's a few different tables to work with. We have a table called products. And we have a table called versions. And then we have a table called product versions. And product versions is so useful. At least, you know, when I pull the data out of it. So can anybody tell me what this product is? At a glance? Totally useless. It's useful on a data management level, totally useless for a human. I want to capture my hand gestures. <laughs> So how would you resolve this issue? You'd use a join. Now, I'm going to break this down on multiple lines. So I'm going to join products on
like such. So now I'm going to run this whole thing. And now you're going to notice, here's some of the weird, the weird fun stuff. Because I added an extra column, I've got everything from product. Um, everything from product versions. And then everything from products. So the star suddenly starts becoming less and less useful. When you're dealing with only one column, the star is really useful. When you're dealing from columns from multiple tables, it's not so useful. Here's one of the reasons. ID and ID. At a glance, can you tell me which one's which? No. So I'm going to go add on here a few things. Let's say I say, just so you can see what the error message is, I'm going to select ID. Now we know there's two columns called ID. So just so you know what the error message looks like. Column reference ID is ambiguous. Basically, the database server is telling you to make up your mind. So let's say I want to just keep the product ID. Products.id. So I want the ID from the products table. There, the clause is no longer ha angry. So I'm going to bring my star back just so I can show you the rest, what I want to do. So, so far I've got a product ID, a version ID, blah, blah, blah. But we don't have all the bits and pieces we need. And believe it or not, I actually named these tables like this on purpose. So when I did this demo, the long columns would line up really nicely for you guys. There's some visual planning in this. So now I'm going to return. Um, I got my product. I've got my product. Now these are the product versions. That's the product. And then here's my version information. So in other words, this product version, product 15, is ANZAP version 3. It's still not that useful. However, this is where some of the magic happens. I go products.name as, well, should I call it product name, comma, versions.name as version, so let's call it version, comma, uh, the MSRP. Now I've got a product with a price. By doing a join, I'm able to get a human-readable version, a human-readable product name, and the MSRP. It's like magic. Well, it's not. It's SQL. But it's like magic. And we can do our usual order by like that. So now we got a nice sorted list of products in the MSRPs. So far, so good, for the most part. No, because I'm only running one statement. Here, I'll just make people happy there. For the anal retentives in the group. There it is. Now, this is a comp, it's not a complex join. It's a straightforward join. It's just I'm doing two joins. As I was, this is to show you guys, you can do as many joins as you want. But the order is important. As you notice, I'm joining products to product versions. Where's product versions? It's before products. I'm, connect collect I'm connecting versions. It's also connected to product versions. Product versions is above. I couldn't do from products and then join versions and then at the end have product versions. That would blow up because, well, it's not near the correct order. So, once again, this you've seen. I, in other words, you're saying, I want to grab everything from product. Well, I'm going to grab the names from product versions. And I'm going to join products. In other words, I want to add to my data set the data from a table called products on. This is the, called the point of commonality between the two. This is what usually mess people up when you're first learning how to do joins. And what's the point of commonality? In this case, it's the primary key of products. In other words, the ID of products is equal to 
I don't know, of course, if I had spaces in here, this would work better. The foreign key product ID in product versions. So in product versions, I've got the product ID, and it maps to the ID of a product. And that's how the map the mapping works. And then I did a second join. The syntax is exactly the same. Once you learn how to do the syntax of one, you can keep adding and adding. Now, uh, sometimes I'll have people ask me, hey, by the way, can you, is, is the order on each side of this equal sign important? Not particularly. So this one does, I could put product versions dot product ID here and products dot ID here, and it would work. That order is not important. The order that's important is from top to bottom, not left to right. And I'm going to expand this one more time. Like such. So now I can go I'm running out of room. Can't remember what the last column was called. Yeah, it's not going to let me sort that out. All right, now I'm going to do it like that. That's still going to do a decent example of what I'm trying to do. Oh. Yeah, that took 4.1 seconds. Now we know that NZAP3 sold for. That's the MSRP, but that's what they actually sold it at. Now we're getting some useful information when you think about it. The At this point, you have a product and the version. You know how much they sold? You know how much it should have sold for? And you see what the, the price break that the sales rep gave to the person per. And you can see this, uh, this is actually useful information for a manager because you can see who's wasting money by giving extra discounts when they shouldn't. If the guy goes and buys like 25 units, yeah, I give him a price break. And as you can see, this one here, the guy didn't get a price break on that one. Where there was one, 135.28, 135.28. But look at this one. He bought one, 135.28, but he actually sold it for 105. Not, but on the other hand, this guy bought four, so he got a bit of a discount. Less loss overall. This is information that's useful in a business processing system. And theoretically, I could export that as a report. Now, just show you what we used to call SQL reports when I was in school. Because when we were doing this, we were working against an actual microcomputer. Now, I don't know if you guys know what a microcomputer is. Well, you guys know what a PC is. There's the mini, the micro, the minis. Though there's the PC, the micro, the mini, and the the main, the mainframe. And we had what was called a, a micro mini, <laughs> which was something called the AS400. It was supposed to be for the future. We actually had our courses designed around this machine, and then three years later, it died. So you know, luckily some of us were able to get exemptions from that course. However, there was something called SQL reports, and we could output the results of a query to a line printer. How many of you know what a line printer is? Okay, that made me feel real old. Now, I know his background and I know why he knows what those are. But line printers were these printers that were basically a machine that stood by itself with a big box of folded paper under it. And paper would go through and go ah, 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 and would print really, really fast, right? There's the dot matrix printers, which people probably remember, which were like these little things this big that you had on your desk at home. And then, you know, your mother would come into the room and beat you at 3 a.m. when you were printing your report for the next day because you could hear two doors up. Well, the line printers, on the other hand, weren't dot matrix. They actually had, they imagine a big giant typewriter where basically every possible value was a ring. And the ones from IBM that were built in the 70s could output uh, 800 characters per second. 
Now imagine, you know, people that type, you know, 60 words a minute. Imagine if you could output 800 characters a second. In other words, you could hit 800 letters on your keyboard every second. This thing sounded like a like a mini a mini gun going off, and it was loud. So when we were in school, we'd run a query that looked just like this because that was the assignment. But we were to output the results to the printer so we could hand in our work. We had one printer for everybody else, but we had certain requirements where we could alias and give our aliases pretty names. So instead of product name, we could call this. Now you can see this is the first time I've, you're allowed to use double quotes in Postgres. Now it's going to run for four seconds or so. And now you can see we have these nice names going across our columns. Now, if I were to do what, like, what we used to do it when I was in school, actually how businesses ran. So they'd ask for a report, and they'd use their dumb terminal, and they'd go print this report. It would actually create a query, look just like this, run it, and output the results to their line printer. So you'd hit go on this, and instead of showing up on your screen, the line printer would go insane behind you and that's you know how things were done nowadays the good news is you run the query it goes to your application and you just show it to them on screen or it gets rendered as a web page or as a pdf or whatever and you wouldn't worry about these fancy names because they're not programmatically accessible but every once in a while in some places where their technology hasn't updated and I can guarantee there's still banks that have these. And the Canadian government has lots of these still, especially at the DND, because if it works, why replace it? It does the job. There are advantages to these old technologies, but you can make things look pretty using this, using the alias. So this example for shows you lots of stuff. And if I really wanted to, and I'm going to save this query and add it to my little uh, notepad here for you guys. I'm going to start doing some other stuff on here, and that'll be the end of the demo for the night. So let's just say I want to know yes before I continue. Um, <coughs> this is actually just this tool that does that. If I were to run this in a different tool, the data types don't show up. Give me, I'll show you. Give me a second. I just need to load a different tool to do it. Maybe. Different tool. You can see there's no data types, just column names. Huh? Hey? Well, yeah, because it's because I've got non-standard names. If I put in, then there's no quotes. Anyways. That was just to show you that the data types is actually the results of uh, this tool because they're showing you what the data would be. All right, so now to give you guys something a little more useful. And let's just say I want to know 
instead of the quantity, I'm going to get rid of this data down here. And I want to know what the average quantity, and I could put that on another line because it's getting too long, like this. Bang. Now remember earlier when I did the average and all you had was a product ID? This is the exact same query, but now it's readable by a manager. Unlike, unlike before we needed to know what that magic number was for, this is readable by a manager. You could output that and just hand it to them. You could sit there, save that as an Excel spreadsheet and just hand it to them. That way they got their numbers. Um, by the same token, I could do the, like such, the average price sold. <clears throat> and normally, if I put the MSRP back, now I'm going to get an error. Why? Because it's not included down here for the ride. If I do this, now I know what the actual price of the product was, and I know what they sold for on average. Therefore, this gives you a closer idea what the profit margin would be on average. Or in this case, what the average loss would be per, if they, were, if they weren't selling it at full price. These are useful queries in business. And this literally has an example of almost everything, minus the having clause. I'm going to save this query also so that you guys have it. Like I said, I'll try to post that on Blackboard as soon as I'm done here. And this is where I'm going to stop for today because usually at this point, people's brains are overloaded and people's eyes start getting glazed over. And I've seen at least four people with glazed over eyes at this point. And at least two of them are in the front row. So which tells me, you know, going back, the percentage is about 50-50 that are glazed over. Um, yes? <laughs> the joint syntax one more time? Okay. Basically what happens is you understand from. From, tell it, grab it from this table. Sometimes you need data from another table to make, to make sure that the actual results are relevant. So you need to join a, another table. The syntax, the modern syntax for a join is the join keyword, which is join. Then you tell it, what am I connecting? So I want to grab everything from table order lines, and I want to connect it to the data from product versions. Therefore, if you want to connect, what's another word for connecting? Joining. The on clause, this guy, is what happens over here. It uses the same syntax as where. You can't use an aggregate in here, but it's the same syntax as the where. However, it's, what the purpose of it is is to identify the point of commonality between the two tables being joined. In other words, we have order lines and product versions. Every order line has a product version ID, otherwise we don't know what was sold. And what's the point of commonality for product version ID? In the product versions table, it's the primary key. Therefore, the ID of product version maps out to the product version ID in order lines. So this is your mapping the relationship between the two tables here. Now, if you do not provide the join, the on clause, you end up doing a full join, which is also known as a Cartesian join. If you guys remember Cartesian math from high school, some of you might, some of you might not. Uh, Cartesian math sucks because it's overly complicated. Um, SQL servers can do Cartesian data maps for you. Why would you want to? I don't know, but you can. There is a purpose for it, but you know, why would you want to? Um, and that's essentially the syntax for a join, for an inner join. Any other questions before I hit the stop record button? Going once, twice. All done.